Next, we're going to look at the positive and negative feedback mechanisms. Now, for the next few slides, the information is from the Oregon State Open Textbook. So I think they did a really good job explaining homeostasis, and they have some really good examples and questions on positive and negative feedback. Homeostasis, we mentioned, is really just a stable, constant internal environment. Now, there are a few things that I want to mention in this process because these terms will help you understand positive and negative feedbacks. In order to maintain homeostasis, we got to have a set point. Right? So this is the physiological value around which the normal range fluctuates. I know it's a very com complex sentence, but basically this is the normal value and you can fluctuate a little bit away from the set point. But again, it's going to be a very small range. Right? So for example, your blood pH can be 7.35 to 7.5, right? Nobody says, hey, your blood pH has to be 7.4. That's not possible. You cannot maintain a certain physiological value at a specific point without any fluctuations. That's not possible. That's why we have a normal range, right? Because there could be some, you know, deviations from the exact phys physiological value. So in this case, the set point could be 7.4, right? And then the normal range is 7.35 to 7.45. And there is another example for the set point and the normal range. So the set point for body temperature is approximately 37, which is 98.6 degrees in Fahrenheit. You can deviate a little bit from this number, right? So my temperature could be 37.3, right? That's still considered normal because it's within that normal range. All right, next term is control centers. So the control centers are usually located in the brain or could be other parts of the body. And they monitor the changes and they react to the changes using the negative feedback. Okay, so they're kind of like the command center they sense the changes and they make a decision and they tell the body what to do. Now we're gonna look at negative feedback first. So if this graph is too much for you, then don't worry, I can just describe everything real quick. So in order to complete this negative feedback, you gotta have a sensor first. Okay? Sensor is also known as a receptor, right? For example, you have temperature receptors in your skin, right? You also have receptors in your stomach, right, to feel the stretching of the wall. So all those are sensors or receptors. They monitor the physiological value, and then they can report that information to the control center. The control center compares the value to the normal range. If the value deviates too much, that means it's outside that normal range, then the control center activates an E factor. The E factor will make a change to reverse the situation. So it's going to go the opposite direction. That's why we call this feedback the negative feedback. So basically, the E factor is going to make a, an opposite change, and this will return the value back to the normal range. OK, so here's an example. Uh, we have body temperature. If it's higher than 37 degrees Celsius, then the nervous cells can sense that, right? And then they're gonna tell the control center that the temperature is not normal. There is temperature regulatory center in the brain. And this regulatory center is going to generate a command and it will be sent to an E factor that could reverse that change. For example, the control center could tell the sweat glands to secrete, right? And this can bring down the body temperature. All right, so that's a negative feedback. There are a lot of examples, but here are some of the common examples. Uh, first one, we talked about blood glucose earlier. Right, blood glucose is controlled by the negative feedback. And specifically, remember, there are two hormones, right? Insulin and glucagon. And we talk about temperature regulation. That's definitely a negative feedback. All right, now positive feedback 
is a little bit different. Positive, positive feedback intensifies the change in the body's physiological condition. So that means if you have a change and that change is gonna trigger positive feedback, this positive feedback is gonna make the change even more dramatic. It's gonna generate an even greater change. It does not go back to the set point. It's gonna go even further away from the set point. Okay. So if you have a set point here, if there is a change in the environment, okay, and it's gonna deviate from the set point, right? So you can see the change is going away from the, the set point. Now, if it's a positive feedback, it's gonna make it go even further away from the set point. Now, if it's a negative feedback, it's going to bring it back down to the set point, right? But positive feedback does the opposite. It's gonna make it go even further, deviate even more from the set point. So that's going to be the positive feedback. And this is going to be the negative feedback. Are there not a, a lot of examples of positive feedback in the body? The example that everybody talks about is a childbirth. So it's a really a, a, a loop, right? Because everything is a part of this positive feedback. So we can start here. Let's say the head of the baby is pushing against the cervix. Right? So the, the receptors in the cervix can sense that change. And then the receptors are going to uh, send that information to the brain right, in the form of nerve impulses. Now, if this was a negative feedback, then the brain would tell the uterus to stop contracting, right? That's what would happen in a negative feedback. But this is not a negative feedback, right? This is a positive feedback. So it's going to do the opposite. So what happens is the brain stimulates the pituitary gland to secrete oxytocin. And what does oxytocin do? Oxytocin stimulates the uterine wall, and it's going to make the, ut the uterus contract even harder to push the baby towards the cervix. So you can see the positive feedback intensifies the change, right? In this case, the positive feedback makes the uterus contract even more violently right, to push the baby out. So that's a pretty good example of positive feedback. I have uh, quite a few practice questions, but I think they're all very good practice questions. All right, so let's look at the first question. After lunch, nerve cells in your stomach respond to the distension. Distension just basically means stretching. Because in this case, food is in your stomach and it's stretching the stomach wall. They relay this information to, so the nerve cells are basically the sensors or the receptors, right? Once they sense a change, they're going to send that information to the control center, which is the brain, right? This is how you have that feeling of it being full, right? So you stop eating. So this is a negative feedback, right? You're taking in food. You don't want your body to take in too much food, right? So once it gets to a set point, then the stomach is going to uh, send that information to your brain to tell your brain, okay, um, I'm full, so stop eating, right? It's, it's a negative feedback. Okay, next question. So this question is pretty straightforward, right? There are really not many examples of positive feedback. So B is the correct answer and all the other answers are negative or examples of negative feedback. Okay, next question.
Okay, I really love this question because remember I said earlier, there are really not that many positive feedback examples. But besides childbirth, this is another good example. The body responds to wound and injury by releasing substances leading to blood clotting. As each step of clotting occurs, it stimulates the release of more clotting substances. You see, it stimulates, it intensifies the changes, right? So this is an example of a positive feedback. Now, just like childbirth, there's a good reason, right, for the body to do this. Um, because this is a protection mechanism. You know, before we have all this modern medicine, right, bleeding can be really bad news. If you lose blood, you know, it could be fatal. So our body has developed this really great mechanism where when you have a little bit clotting substances in the blood, then that will uh, really amplify that response. It's gonna, your body is gonna release more clotting factors to um, really try to stop the, the bleeding. So that's a very good protection mechanism. All right, so A is the correct answer. All right, I think the next question is the last question. All right, just like question six, I really love this question because I think it really um, kind of asks for that advanced thinking process. So you need to you know, understand quite a few things in order to answer this question correctly. What is a plasma osmolarity? So remember when we talk about osmosis, we talk about solute concentrations. So in the blood, a solute can be a lot of things. It could be proteins, it could be electrolytes, you know, it could be glucose. So all those things are dissolved in the plasma, right? So they uh, can be solutes in the plasma. Now osmolarity refers to the concentrations of the total solutes in your blood. So if the plasma osmolarity is too high, that means you have too many of those solutes in your blood, right? It could be, you know, electrolytes, salts. Maybe you are eating very salty food, right? And that, that's not necessarily a good thing because you may deviate from the normal range, right? And your body is not going to like it. So how can we bring the concentrations down? We need to bring in more water, right? To kind of dilute that solute uh, or salt concentrations. How can we bring in more water? We can try to reduce water loss through urine. We can try to retain more water in the body instead of just, you know, urinating it out. So what's the hormone that promotes water retention in the body? Antidiuretic hormone, right? ADH. This is a negative feedback and it's a specific example of regulation of fluid balance. So the correct answer is B. All right, we have done quite a few practice questions today. So I hope now you have a good understanding of homeostasis uh, and, and you know how to differentiate positive and negative feedbacks. So hopefully on the T's, if you see an example, you know whether it's negative or positive. All right, good job guys. I will see you next time.